Okay, so uh, welcome back. Uh, by uh, popular demand, um, based on the uh, closing minutes of our last session, um, there seemed to be uh, an interest and appetite for um, further discussion of uh, functors uh, and understanding um, the principles uh, behind them, but especially their the way in which we capture them within Haskell. And uh, so I, I asked you to uh, watch an additional video. Um, this is this uh, video by Bartosz uh, Miljewski uh, from his um, Programming with Categories uh, course. Um, uh, and it, it was entitled Functors in Programming Category Theory 6.2. Uh, I also asked, uh, I also pulled together some slides, um, which I thought might be responsive by cobbling together a set of different examples, um, most of which are featured either in the, uh, the aforementioned uh, talk by Bartosz or the MIT IEP 2020 uh, lecture that we had previously seen, also led by uh, Bartosz Miluski. Um, but in addition to that, I included um, one or two functors that I thought uh, might uh, you might find additionally interesting. Um, so I have uh, a set of functors. I have uh, uh, coverage, which crosses between um, more a category theoretic perspective, um, making use of, of Hasse diagrams and so on, uh, on the one hand, and uh, Haskell code on the other. Um, and I'm hoping by the end of this session that um, you know, some additional uh, feeling will, will sink in for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I'm going to assume the kind of exposure to type classes that um, occupied us last time and won't be, you know, as much focusing on the syntax or the semantics of, of Haskell so much as um, uh, the real issue of, you know, for a given functor, uh, how to define it so it meets the requisite categorical properties. Um, so uh, with that preamble, I'm just going to switch over to my, um, uh, to my screen here. Uh, I trust you can see my screen, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's great. Let me turn down the light again, because uh, it exhibits marked glare against my pallid complexion. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, this, the topics um, that in an ideal world I'd, I'd hope to touch on, on which I'd hope to touch, um, I'll concentrate on the examples, but, um, uh, but also uh, give a bit of an intuition for um, this terminology of, of lifting a functor. So we, excuse me, lifting a function um, from, uh, operating on normal, in this case, Haskell types, to operating uh, in the domain is mapped to by the functor, which also happens to be in Hask, but um, is going between set of A and B. If the function is between A and B, it goes between F, uh, FA and FB, where F is, is the functor. Um, and we talk about lifting it so that instead of just being a function which performs squares of integers, it performs squares on lists of integers to return a list of squares, et cetera. Um, um, and in concentrating on the relationship of the, the Haskell functors to those in category theory. Um, I'll try to weave in some discussion of functoriality. I mean, the, the term is, is bandied about a lot. Uh, and, and it's basically referring to things which uh, carry functorial properties. Um, uh, and these notably include in varying contexts, you know, an emphasis on the ability to lift functions, but uh, critically, um, and especially from a categorical uh, standpoint, um, honoring of composition, um, the capacity to, uh, to map uh, not just functions individually, but to ensure that 
if we have the composition of two functions, um, that that gives the same result as mapping those two functions and then um, and then uh, composing the results. I didn't say that well. We could either compose before mapping um, and map that, or we could map both the functions compose and uh, and we should get the same result. Um, so functoriality has to do with this sort of preservation or honoring of composition uh, and by extension identity as well, uh, maps identity um, uh, an identity morphism to an identity morphism um, when mapped by the functor. Um, Bartosz uh, talked in, um, in that new lecture that I suggested for today about this kind of metaphor as um, functors as containers. And he made an extended argument for why it's less naive or oversimplified than some people might at first blush um, think. Uh, arguing about the at a, at a deeper level the lack of foundational distinctions between data types on the one hand and computations on the other, and um, uh, and in addition to pointing to kind of a useful mnemonic um, functors as structure preserving mapping that that do often serve as, as kind of containers of the value they map. Um, uh, so if you have a maybe of A, it kind of contains an A sort of, um, or a list of uh, a list of A, it, you know, we map from, uh, from int to list of ints, it kind of contains ints. Um, in addition to serving as that, it turns out that this will link back this kind of ability to shift between uh, uh, computation and data structures. Um, well, it, it's actually points to a rather deep line of thinking, uh, germane to category theory, which will resurface in the Oneida, the Oneida lemma, which is uh, an incredibly powerful and I might add practical um, uh, result um, proof uh, that that's emerged from mathematics and uh, that again points to um, the fact that these boundaries are less strict than, than we might think. Um, and uh, although it was, really wasn't brought out in, in um, uh, Bartosz's uh, two videos, earlier we heard Brendan, I think it was in the MIT uh, category theory course, um, talk about uh, that uh, functors uh, are, um, in as much as they uh, preserve composition of, of mappings of functions and of, of morphisms, um, functors themselves are mappings. They are mappings from HOM set to HOM set. A set of functions between A and B is mapped to a is mapped as a as a function to a set of functions between f of a and f of b. And I'm, I'm kind of assuming a locally small category here. So the, the source set of, of, more, of functions between a and b is, uh, is finite. Um, and it, we can get more fancy for the, uh, when that's not the case. Um, so there's composition of functors, it turns out. The, the fact that this is a mapping, objects to objects that functors capture and morphisms to morphisms mean that um, those functions can be composed, uh, uh, giving a mapping of identity from, from category C to category D and another one from D to E. We can compose those mappings, um, those functions, mapping objects and get a mapping of objects from C to E. And, and so it is with mapping of morphisms. And this allows us to compose functors. Um, uh, which is uh, rather pleasing. Um, uh, and moreover, there's an identity functor, um, uh, functor that just maps A to, to itself. And we'll, we'll see that in its kind of um, Haskell guise. It is a bit of a mask on um, because of some restrictions in Haskell, but um, we'll see how that's manifest in a Haskell, Haskell code. And the fact that we have an identity functor 
and, and, and we have composition of functors and the functors are mappings, uh, structure preserving mappings uh, between two categories um, naturally invites the question, you know, uh, is there a category where functors are the morphisms that we have an entity for which we have an entity and composition and where objects are, well, categories? And, and the answer is yes, and it's cat. Um, although to be rigorous, a lot of people will say it's the category of small categories, um, category of, of of categories where we have a uh, where we have a countable number of um, or finite number of of, of uh, different categories within it, finitely sized uh, categories. Um, okay, um, so we we talked about functors as structure preserving mappings and and diagrammatically the map objects to objects here, they map identity morphisms to identity morphisms, they map, uh, should have said first, they map morphisms to morphisms, but they deal especially, they honor mapping of identity morphisms by taking an identity morphism in the source and mapping it to an identity morphism in the target category. Um, and moreover, they will map composition of morphisms in the source into the, the composition of the mappings of those morphisms in the target. So we can either take F and map it and H and map it and compose them in the target and get this guy, or we can compose F with H in the source and map, that's this one, and then map the results and we'll get the same thing. It honors it, it preserves it, it captures that structure in the source category and preserves it in the target category. Um, that we're guaranteed to have those be the same morphisms. And we're guaranteed to, that an identity here if map serves as an identity over in the target. Okay. Um, and uh, they, also, we're going to be preserving uh, uh, the, the associativity property uh, as well. Uh, that that there's uh, uh, these mappings are are associative. Okay, um, so let's talk about uh, a set of functors, and I, I, this is kind of going to be a, a greatest hits in, in a way. Um, uh, so. One functor that was hit early and hit often in the, in the two videos was uh, the maybe functor. So here we have Hask over on the left with all these types and uh, where the those are the objects and morphisms uh, are these functions between types. So um, we might have, for example, a ceiling function that goes from float to int. We might have, um, many functions which go from int to int. Maybe there's a square, for example, or a cube, which, which takes in an int and gives back its, its cube or, or gives back its square or gives back its, uh, you know, its 100th product or what have you. But there's a very special such identity or such self-morphism, which is the identity morphism. And I've drawn that in in this special notation to indicate it's not any old morphism here. It's the identity morphism. I've also drawn it that way because in Hasse diagrams like this, we normally do not draw those. And so I'm kind of violating the, the normal convention here. Um, and the maybe functor is going to map uh, each of these types here into uh, a corresponding type here. So float is going to be mapped to maybe float. Um, int is going to be mapped to maybe int, uh, and bool is going to be mapped to maybe bool. Um, and I've tried to draw in, in these sort of gray lines um, what you know what's mapped to what. Um, now, not only does it map object to objects, the more interesting thing is how it maps morphisms. And um, you know, in general, a morphism will be mapped uh, if there's a morphism between objects A and B, say between int and bool here, it'll be mapped to a morphism 
um, between the mappings of A and the mappings of B here, maybe int and maybe bool. Um, and this is why we say it's a function between HOM sets. For each possible element of this, uh, of this HOM set between int and bool, each one of them is mapped to some morphism over here uh, between the corresponding mappings uh, of the two endpoints. Int and bool, maybe int, maybe bool. You got to pick some morphism over here for that morphism. It can't just disappear in the mapping. Um, uh, so, so we have this mapping between HOM sets involved. Uh, but to, to really be functorial, to guarantee functor properties, we have to map this uh, identity morphism to the identity morphism and uh, this composition to that composition. We said it earlier. Um, and these mappings of, of morphisms over here, these mappings of functions like it is even, will be what we call a lifted version of that original one. It's lifted to not just operate from int to bool, to operate from maybe int to maybe bool. It's sort of lifted to, to operate in this more, um, um, in this functor domain. Um, and I'm mapping maybe ints to maybe bools, not just in any willy-nilly way, but in a, in a sort of way that, that is guaranteed to have some properties. Um, so here we have uh, these mappings um, and we call it lifting uh, because we could diagram it out like this. Here's the, the function between A and B. Maybe it's between maybe n to maybe bool. And by mapping it with a functor, um, which is accomplished in Haskell with F map, F mapping it that particular function um, so that it applies within a certain functor context, in this case, maybe. Now we have something that goes between maybe A and maybe B. So we've lifted it up to the top uh, of, this, um, of this rectangle. And uh, this is something which we would hope will preserve some properties. So uh, if we, when you look at a diagram like this, your mind should go to whether it commutes. You know, so if we first go, we take an int, um, and we bring it over to a maybe event, a uh, corresponding maybe event. And then we F map it maybe by asking, um, you know, is it, is it negative or is it, po is it positive? And then we get a maybe a bool that indicates whether it was positive. Um, so maybe that it was three. And so we get out a, a maybe or a just of true. Uh, by contrast, we could map it down here using F. We have a, a three, we ask, is it positive? And the answer is true. And then we could map that over and get a maybe of true. Um, by map, you get over to the maybe domain. And there's a, uh, uh, there's a correspondence between those. There's uh, it, this, this square here commutes. Um, and we talked about the maybe functor last time. Um, as sort of being a yielding a sort of pointed situation where our original type A, which might be characters, for example, as a bunch of characters, and maybe augments that with a special uh, designated one that we call nothing. Um, and uh, the definition could be something like this. Uh, you have this type constructor and two data constructors, one to indicate nothing and one to indicate just A. Um, and then we've got to specify uh, a definition for maybe um, that will let it be a full class, full, first class functor citizen. And that means we have to specify an F map, which uh, whose job in life will be to take in a function from A to B, that's this function uh, here, this F, um, and lift it. it it's got to lift it. The result of F map has to be from maybe of A to maybe of B. Um, and so we have something like this. Um, and so we have to define it to serve as, um, as, a, uh, as an F map. Uh, so for each functor, we're going to have to create our own F map. Um, and, and the question is, well, what should that be for a given functor? 
Uh, remember, this is an example of ad hoc polymorphism. We're saying maybe implements functor, and I've got to tell it the particular way for my functor, maybe functor, how f map is defined. Uh, so uh, what's it going to do? Anyone? What, what is it going to do? So we have a function from A to B. And suppose we were given a maybe of A. Let's suppose that was were nothing. Suppose we're given something and there's no A there, it's just nothing. Um, what are we what are we gonna give back as our maybe of B? Anyone? What, what's what's the only really thing we can give back? We have this function from A to B, but all we have is nothing. We're not even given an A. So what can we give back as a possibility of either nothing or just some B? What, what's the only thing we can really get back? Nothing. Nothing, yeah. I mean, we can't even create a B, right? Like we don't know what B is. B could be a hash table, it could be a tree, it could be a, you know, a list, it could be a, who knows what, what uh, object. And we don't even know what it is. So we can't even create it. We can't even give you know, a kind of dumb one of it or a distinguished one. We don't know what it is. So all, all our hands are kind of tied. All we can give back is a nothing. And there'll be a maybe a B. Um, don't get confused. There's a kind of a nothing in the context of maybe of A and then it's a, a, a nothing that is a maybe a B as well. And, um, and that's all we can get back. Okay, so suppose by contrast, this maybe of A has a just three in it and suppose this uh, mapping from A to B is asking is it, it is positive. What can we do if we have a just three and this we have an is positive that maps ints to bools, what can we do to get a maybe a B? What's a possible thing we can do to get a B? We don't we don't have a B, but we have a mapping from A to B and we have a just 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 three, which is maybe of A, so we actually have an A, it's three. What can we do? We need a B, how can we get a B? How can we manufacture a B? Unwrap the maybe and uh, yeah. apply the function and wrap it back up. Yeah, exactly. So we have this function from int to bool, we have an end, if we could just extract it, we could apply this function and get a bool and then wrap it up in a, in a maybe a B. And, and so it's, it's oh my God, oh, that's horrible. Uh, I didn't do the last step there, sorry. Um, I was going too quick. Um, so, so this is just um, as the, the, last, the last step there. So this is our, our maybe of A here that we've been given and we're saying it gives us a maybe a B, right? Um, so we have f applied to this value, which is a, um, and I'm kind of following the class by writing a different name for now uh, to avoid any confusions about what's the type variable and what's the what's the uh, what's indica indicator of a, of an actual value. But uh, here we have a, a value of type a. We pass it to F and we get a value of type B and we just wrap it in just and that gives us a maybe a B. Any questions on this? On the Haskell syntax, on the conceptually what's going on? Um, you know, this F is that. It's not the functor. F is not the functor. This is one thing I find really confusing in discussions of because F masquerades Sometimes in a functor context, it's lowercase because it's a type variable when something takes uh, an arbitrary functor. And then here, here it's a function, uh, which is its dominant use. So this is F, just X is, is uh, maybe A. Here's another example of a maybe A. And we're giving a rule with this function. If, if maybe A is a nothing, we give back a nothing for maybe B. If uh, maybe A is just X, we take the X and we apply F to it, that gives us a B and we, we just uh, it to insert it into the maybe, to inject it in the maybe. And that gives us maybe a B. Any questions on this? If not, we'll go into the next example of a functor. Questions?
Going once, going twice. Okay, sold. Okay, um, so here we've mapped maybe to maybe, right? Nothing mapped to nothing. Uh, these individual elements mapped to individual elements there. Um, that was my scroll from last time. Okay, here's identity functor. Um, uh, I thought I'd move this later, but um, it's actually a slightly confusing example, but it's worth um, it's worth it's worth emphasizing the difference between what's going on in Haskell and the kind of conceptual model. See, so identity functor, you know, really maps uh, an object to an object, an morphism to an object to itself, and a morphism to itself. Um, and it looks like this: int is mapped to int, float is mapped to float. Bool is mapped to bool, and it, and uh, morphisms between them, like is even between an int and a bool, is mapped to is even between int and a bool, um, and naturally it preserves identity morphisms here functions in Hask uh, they're mapped to the same function, and it preserves composition of functions because they're mapped to the composition over here. Um, uh, so. Uh, here it's it's sort of a trivial oh sorry it's a trivial mapping um and uh you know here we have kind of a trivial lifting right we have a function between from a to b maybe a is ints and b is bools um and we map it to the same function between a and b between ints and bools and int is mapped to int we map mapped to bool that's what it is in kind of an ideal context. That's what we'd like to have. Now, the strictures of, of programming languages uh, don't always allow ideal modes of expression. And Haskell is not an exception, although it's got, I think, uh, uh, better. it's much better in that regard than most languages. And um, in Haskell, we have to, you know, have use the kind of, slightly awkward uh, uh, pragmatic step of, um, of having in place a, uh, a sort of wrapper here that's, that's called identity. So in, in actually how this is implemented, int is mapped to identity int. Uh, float is mapped to identity float. Bool is mapped to identity uh, bool. And is even, is mapped to a lifting of is even, um, which just gives back the same function. Let's see how that works. Um, so, you know, this is the actual implementation F is, there's still an F map to go from identity A to identity B that has to deal with kind of this wrapping junk, um, the cruft that comes from this mapping. Um, uh, okay, so, um, uh, the functor here is of this sort. So we have identity and it has only one constructor, one type of uh, some, one value constructor, um, uh, data constructor, make ID. Uh, and, and then when we declare it as an instance of functor, we have to declare the F map. Um, and how are we gonna F map something? here so we have again we have a function from a to b that we need to lift right um uh we have a function from a to b and we want to lift it to be from identity a to identity b and the easiest way to define this in haskell is to say how does it handle different identity a's we saw that with not handling nothing and handling just for the case of maybe let's go see how it operates for this case of identity um, so what are we going to do here to get an identity B? So we have an identity A given to us, and we have a mapping from A to B. So what can we do to get an identity B? What do we have to do? I guess one way that wasn't mentioned yet is you could lift the function A to B and then apply it to an identity A. Okay, but this is, so 
this is in fact how we are defining the lifted function. So this, this is like our definition of lifting. That's what FMAP is, is it's saying, how do we lift? So we're defining FMAP. F is from A to B and FMAP is gonna be from, therefore from identity A to identity B. So we're trying to say, what is this function from identity A? And we're trying to say it by saying F map of F when applied to an identity A, it gives some identity B. That's going to define this function, if you see what I mean. So, um, okay, I see. Yeah. Uh, I so, guess then the only answer is what similar to what Alex said about the, the maybe exactly. where you unwrap and exactly. then you apply the function and then you wrap it again. That's exactly right. Like we just have to, we have an identity A and it's got an A in it. It's got this A in it. Unlike maybe we don't have to deal with this, you know, this persnickety nothing case or this annoying nothing case, nuisance nothing case. We definitely have an A here and an identity A. We just have to, to go and, and get it. And, and once we get it, we can F map it. And we'll get identity B and then we have to rewrap it up. So, so, so there it is. Um, so given this A, we, we, this is with pattern matching. We, we extract the A from here. We know it must have been created with, with this constructor, um, this, this data constructor. Um, and we go and extract it. We, we call it A here, I should call it X. And, um, and then we, we're going to return uh, Returned f of a, but we have to pass it into this data constructor so that we'll get an identity b. f of a is of type what? What is f of a? It's of type f is for, from a to b, so f of a is going to be of type what? Okay, so suppose we're mapping a function is from int to bool. Maybe it's is positive, right? Um, we have identity three. So this is int to bool. This is identity. This is three here, um, and therefore when we pattern match this a here is three we apply F, which is is positive to three, and what do we get back? We get back, is, is three positive or not? Yeah. You get back a bull? You get back a bull, and what bull is it? <laughs> yeah, it's a bull. It's a bull. That's the main thing I was looking for. It's, it happens to be true because three, three is positive last time I checked. So you get back a three and then you do make ID on, on, uh, sorry, you get, you do is positive on three and you get back true. And then you do make ID on true and you get back an identity B, which is identity bull. So that's how this works. F of A is, is in general a B. Uh, given a value within A, it, it gets back a B. And when we inject it in with, uh, with make ID, we get an identity B. So here we're, F is this guy, this function, make ID is, is of type identity A. That, this is just pattern matching for a value of uh, identity A. And this whole thing is of, of uh, type identity B, FA is of type B. We're, pl we're applying this function to a particular value of type A and we get back a B, so this is B. Any questions on this before I go into another example? We have a lot of these examples and you'll see them one by one. Maybe it will better sink in if you see a few more. Yeah, question from, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I'm not sure why why here for the identity functor, it will 
uh, specifically use the container identity and make ID instead of uh, just uh, map back A to A directly. So is it makes it more, looks more like a functor or yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so you're saying like why in Haskell can't we define something like this, right? Like yeah. directly specify something like this. Um, I think, uh, well, okay, first of all, you could, um, you could always say something like, um, so you could, you could say, you could provide a type depth, a, a type definition, sort of um, directly defining a type identity A to just be A. So to, to say that, you know, anything that's an identity A, like if it's a bool, it's a bool. If it's an int, it's an int. Um, the problem is you're not gonna be able to easily um, then define that to be, uh, to be an instance of a type class. And therefore defining using ad hoc polymorphism fmap for it will uh, will be difficult. I mean, you could create an fmap identity, like call it fmap identity, which is its name, um, which would take an A and give back f of A, right? Um, uh, so it would take an F and it would take an A and it would give back a B by wh whose value is F applied to A. Um, that, that actually would work. You could say, you know, just declare a function, fmap identity. It wouldn't be an instance of functor, um, uh, of the functor type class. And therefore, uh, you know, it, it, it couldn't be used as if it were uh, a functor here, um, but it would work. And you actually see in Bartosz's lecture, one of those lectures, I think it's the one on, on the YouTube, not the one from MIT. He, um, sorry, both are on YouTube. It, it was the one um, in his uh, programming with category 6.2 or, or what have you, the, the older course he taught. Um, I think he actually kind of flirts with that, but uh, maybe eventually defines it this way. Um, I, I think that's the kind of main fly in the ointment. I mean, it's, it's not that big a deal, right? Like. Like, yes, you could have a fmap identity and, and just define it that way. Um, but it, it, it wouldn't, it'd be hard to sort of call it a functor. Here we're taking advantage of parametric polymorphism. We're saying no matter what A is, this is how you go create it. And that allows us to then make use of this type class functor. You know, it's, uh, it's a kind of, nuisance um, one way or the other. Uh, I don't know which is worse, to be honest. Um, I find this for students might be a bit confusing. Um, anyway, uh, uh, probably more distraction. Let's go on and, and talk about uh, some additional ones. So here's list functor. So for list functor, we want to map int to a list of int, float to a list of floats. So the job in life is to map those objects, but more deeply and more significantly in terms of preserving structure, it maps morphisms between those objects, namely types, into morphisms over here in the mapped area. So is even is mapped into a lifted version of is even. So if you have is even between int and bool, it'll be mapped into a lifted, lift, uh, lifted version of is even that could take a list of ints and give you a list of bools. Mm. Um, and, uh, and you know, likewise, it, it has to preserve composition and has to preserve these uh, identity morphisms. Okay, so this picture should be getting familiar. We have a function A between ints and bools, and we want to lift it to be between a list of ints and a list of bools, for example. Right? Um, F map of F, in the context of this functor, um, 
is going to map between list A and list B. Um, uh, and because it, we're adhering to a type class, we don't have to uh, say this is F map for this functor. If we didn't have that type class there, we'd have to, we'd have to say this is, you know, uh, a mapping for identity or what have you. Okay, so here we're going from A to A and um, list of A is defined recursively. Uh, this is an example of a recursive data structure. Uh, it can either be nil or it can be the cons of uh, a value and uh, list, uh, a list of A. Um, this is kind of the tail of the list. So this cons is uh, uh, terminology from Lisp that goes back at least to the 1960s and maybe the 1950s. Um, uh, when McCarthy at Stanford invented Lisp, uh, uh, the, a Lisp list oriented pro processing language, um, uh, the implementations with Lisp were central. That's why it's a list oriented language. And um, a lot of the terminology actually reflects assembly language statements on the computers at that time. So car is used for the first, first element of a list, C-A-R and Lisp uh, and its dialects like scheme, uh, racket, um, and a cutter, C-D-R is used for tail. Um, and cons, I think, um, came out of uh, something there. I, I don't actually think it's an assembly language, name of assembly language instruction. It's, it's, it's something else. But basically what this is saying is like, put together a pair where this is the first element and this is the, the next element. And so when we have a list, either it's empty or we have some item in it first and then we have followed by another list, which by the way, could be empty. Um, but this is kind of the rest of the list. And so it goes, so this is a recursive data structure. List A is on both sides. Um, and um, the goal here is not to get too caught up in that, but if we have such a list, we need to define FMAP for it. Um, as an instance of functor, it has to define FMAP. And what is this FMAP gonna do? It's gonna take a function from A to B and it's gonna map it um, it's going to return to us a function from list of A to list of B, right? That's exactly what this is. The F map of it is going to be from these things. Um, so that's F map's job in life, right? Um, and how is it going to do that? How is it going to do that? Well, um, to define this function, it's convenient to say if we get the F and then we get a value of list A, then I can specify a value for list B. List A's come in, a, in two varieties, so we'll need to handle each of those. So what do you think it will do for nil? If, if we have a list that's empty, that's what nil means, it's empty list. Um, what are we gonna give back for our list of B? We have this function that it, given an A can give us a B, but we don't even have an A. All we have is this, this empty list, nil. So what do we have to give back? We have to give back what? Kind of like the maybe construct when we had nothing. What do we have to give back? What's the only thing we can get back? We can't create a B out of thin air. So what do we have to give back? A list of B can either be nil or it could be cons of some B and a, the rest of the list. So what do we have to get back? Nil? No. Nil. No. There's no other choice. We have to get back nil. It's the only choice because we can't create a B out of whole cloth. Like B can be anything. We don't know how to create it. We can't say make it minus one or something. It be, might be double or hash table or whatever. Okay. Um, so how about for this case of cons? So if we have a if we have a pair of an A and the rest of the list, a head of the list and the tail of the list, what can we do if, if we have to apply this function to a list of A and it, we're, we're gonna need a list of Bs 
We have a list of A's and we're gonna to have to have a list of B's. We, we divide and conquer. So if we have a, if, if list A here is not nil, we've already defined the nil case is giving back nil. But if list A is, is a pair of an A and the rest of the list, the head and the tail, what can we do? We, we have an A in the head, right? That's what this one is. So what can we do to get a B? To at least take a step towards our, where we need to go. If we have an A at the head of the list, what can we do to get a B? We can... We could apply the the A to B to the head. Yeah, yeah. We can apply the function to the head and it will give us a B. So we've made one step. Now we still have to deal with the rest of the list, right? We still have the rest of the list to deal with. Um, but we can, uh, we can do that recursively. Uh, so here we have a head and a tail. And uh, we're going to take the head and apply F to it. And then we got to deal with the tail. And how are we going to deal with that? Well, uh, well, we, we know how to get a, given a, a, this function and given a list of A, we know how to get a list of B. That's what F map is. And so uh, it's the tail of this list, the list B is going to be the F map of this function on the tail, um, the tail of, of, of this guy, which is a, a list of A. And if we apply it recursively to that in this way, um, we'll get a list of B. We'll be guaranteed to get a list of B. So we just call this recursively. We call it recursively. We call it recursively all the way down. Um, Okay, good. Um, so it's following us all the way down. Um, and this gives us overall a list of type B because we have cons of this guy and a list of B. Okay, um, any questions about this? Once again, we've specified for a function, given a list of A, what do we get out and by having gone through that, the two possibilities here, we have you know, a, a, a function that uh, F map that defines for any list A, how we get a list B. But any questions on this? Going once, going twice. Okay, reader. Can a reader is maybe arguably it's a bit more subtle. We have a mapping from types, say int, to a function which takes in some, I put it, called it E for environment. Um, it, uh, it's some fixed type um, and it gives us an int. It maps from float to functions from E to float. Uh, e is fixed here. For all of these, it's the same E. From double, E to double. From integer to e to integer. And the same thing for these composite data types. If we have a pair over here of double and integer, then we get a function from e to, to, double, to the pair double integer. Okay, so this is the reader functor for objects. What does the reader functor do for functions? Well, it lifts them to operate on this, um, on their, their mapping of the objects. So if we have a function from int to bool is even, 
it turns into a lifted version of it that takes in a function that goes from e to int and turns it into a function that goes from e to bool. And it does so, this lifting, in ways that preserve identity morphisms. So if we have something that takes in an int, returns the same int, lifting it should take in something that takes in an e to int and returns the same, same function. Uh, and the same thing for bool. OK. Um, so the reader functor maps things like this. Um, uh, for morphisms, it maps a function according to fmap. So it's taking in a function like this, and it's returning a function from e to a to e to b. It lifts this function to operate on these reader things, taking in this and giving this. Just like when we lifted a function to operate a list, it took in uh, by lifting it, we could go from list of A to list of B, or with maybe uh, by lifting A to B, we could go from maybe of A to maybe of B. This is just the, the variety of that. Okay, um, and the thing which emerges um, from Fartosh's lecture is that it's actually a, uh, a particularly terse sort of, definition here. I um, mean, you can actually do it in a point free style even, even more tersely. Um, but the idea is, look, um, if I, and I've actually written it here without the type class because of the amount of sort of cruft that, that comes in in packing and unpacking things. Um, so F map of an F on uh, a value uh, R. So if this is a reader from E to A, how are we going to get a reader from E to B? Well, first of all, um, we, we need something here which uh, will take in an E because um, um, FMAP has got to, has got to, given an E to A, it's got to give us an E to B. So we need something that, that takes in an E. What's something that takes in an E? Well, it's F, uh, sorry, excuse me, it's R. So R has to be the first thing that's, that's executed. So we're gonna start with R. It's gonna take in an E. Okay, so far so good. Taking in an E, great. Um, now, how are we gonna get ourselves uh, a B? Well, R, it's going to take in an E and it's going to give us an A. That's great. How are we going to get from an A though to a B? We need to return a B here. How are we going to get uh, a B? All we have is an A. So how can we get a B to, to return? Where can we get a B from if we have an A? Do we have anything that can give us a B from an A? Do we have something? Oh, look, there's, <laughs> there's something that, that takes in an A and it gives us a B over here on the left-hand side. Um, so we're in luck, right? Um, R takes in an E and gives us an A. So if we start with R, we can convert from E's to A's. That's great. Now we need a, a B. How are we going to get a B? We can we have this thing that can turn A's into B's. Great. So we apply F to the results of R, and we're going to get back a B. Whoa! What am I? What am I doing? And we get back a B. Um. And so we're going to apply F after R. This is F. We're going to apply it after R to get this. Uh, this is going to give us a function which takes in an E. And once we compose it with R, it's going to, uh, this function uh, R takes in an E and gives us an A. 
and then by passing it to F, that's going to give us a B from that A, and then we are uh, we're a happy camper because we've got something end to end that takes in an E and returns uh, a B. Um, that's the idea here. Um, this is something that takes in uh, an E and returns a B. Any questions on that? I know it's kind of succinct um, and it, it, again, it can be in, written in point freestyle um, even more tightly as Bartosz points out. But any questions on this? This is the composed syntax. This is like open circle mathematically. Uh, this means F, apply F after R. R goes first and whatever R returns, pass it to F. And that defines a complete function that goes from E to B. E because that's what R takes in. That's what R is bound to. Okay. Any questions on this? Question? You notice, by the way, Shaoyan, here I discarded the type class stuff. I, this is what I could have done basically for identity. I could have done something like this and dispensed with type classes and then just had identity be defined as type identity A equals A and, and would have been fine. Okay, so lifting here, this is out of order. Should have been, should have been before oops, should have been before this um okay let's talk about another one uh oh okay um no uh oh this is okay this is with string this is one defined by it was brendan or david speedback um i think it may be brendan so this what this factor is going to basically uh, append a, or not append, it's going to pair up uh, any data type with a string. So it's going to map int to a pair of int and string. It's going to map float to a pair of float and string. It's going to map double to a pair of double and string. So whatever data type, it's just going to pair it up with a string. Um, so like an int that's three might be paired up with a, um, you know, three and foo or something like that um, in a pair. So this is a, a pair. This is, I, I should put parentheses around it, but it's a tuple within, within Haskell in ways that will become particularly important uh, soon. You'll see this is a product. Um, Okay, so here's with string, um, and I didn't have time to make these kind of nicely uh, unroll, uh, unfurl in a kind of uh, slow, meticulous way. Okay, so here we're mapping types to product of type and strings. It's just a pairing of them. Um, the functor here maps objects to objects, types to types and morphisms to morphisms. Um, so it's got a map is even to something that is a lifted version of is even that can map int cross strings to bool cross strings, pairs of ints and strings to bools ints and strings. And how's it gonna do that? Well, it's gonna apply it to its first, um, first element. So here's the with string type constructor. This is its data associated data constructor. It is an instance of functor. And so we need to write uh, an F map that goes from, that takes in an A to B and gives us something that maps with string um, from A comma S, S is string, uh, to with string B comma S. 
So the job of FMAP is to lift it, right? Um, the job of FMAP is to lift it up. It's to lift it to operate between the, the functor mapped type. So if we have an A, we're gonna map it in this case, we're talking about to a with string A. We'll just get a pair A up with a string. And B is can be lifted to a with string B, which we'll is gonna pair it up with a string. And our F map of F is gonna be something that goes from with string A to with string B. It's gonna go from a pair of A and S, A and a string to a pair of a B and a string. Um, okay. Um, so that's what we want. How is it going to operate? Um, well, uh, pretty straightforward. We just do the same pattern matching we've done before. There's not even two cases to handle. It's just one, one case to handle. It's this case. So all we have to do is kind of deconstruct or destructure it. We, we sort of uh, go and pattern match it. We extract each element. We extract the the actual value, the int or the bool, we extract the string associated with it. And now we need something that's a with string of B. How are we gonna get that? Well, we have something that's an A. How can we get a B? Where can we get the B from? Whence can we get the B? It should start to look very familiar. Or give it a function from A to B. Where can we get a B? All we have is an A. Where can we get our B? We can do it by giving it to the what? Please, folks, put me out of my misery. Applying the what function. can we do? Yeah, we, we apply the function. We apply the function to the A. We have an A. We have a function from A to B. Just apply the stinking function to it, right? Um, and we apply the stinking function to the A and we get out a B, which smells like a rose. And, um, and we just give it the same string. Uh, it, it, the string is just this kind of payload that we pull along. Um, uh, so give it the same string. Um, and, and that gives us back uh, a with string of B, which is what we wanted. That's all it is. Now you might ask, well, why why do we give it the same string? Why don't we, you know, append something to it, <laughs> saying, you know, I was here or something like that? Well, you could. I mean, uh, would it be functorial? Um, well, you'd have to be careful what the identity was, right? Um, like like we'd need this identity. When we map identity, it has to map to identity. And so we'd need to map this one here. When we lift identity here, that couldn't be appending like I was here to the string every time because then it wouldn't serve as identity. We wouldn't, you know, by composing it with something else, we wouldn't get a, another fun function um, in this domain. We wouldn't get that other function back if every time it was appending I was here to it. Um, uh, so we'd, we'd have to be cautious in that. Like that, that would have to map to an identity uh, here. And uh, in general, it's, it's this um, observation of the functoriality of, the, of, of honoring uh, both identity and honoring um, composition that restricts what this mapping could be on, on this side, like, like well, in general, what it, what it is. Like um, we, we would need an identity composed with anything else in this domain, which would, which would give that something else back. Um, and then we would also need to make sure composition is honored. So if we had two things here, that we compose that they'd give a composition here um, that, that gives exactly the same thing. So that's what we'd have to be careful about when we're dealing with this string. Um, uh, 
Uh, right. And we noted like seg two upper here is not a legitimate morphism, therefore, because if we compose it with, um, if, if we use that for our identity, even just going around the identity multiple times would be different than going around it once. Uh, sorry, no, that's not true, because would once it's upper, always upper. But um, going around it zero times is different than going around it once. And composing it with, uh, with uh, yeah, and, and, and so it, it wouldn't uh, honor the, uh, the identity, um, uh, the, ident the role of identity. Um, that's, uh, uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd have to uh, explain that more, but it, it, it we, we talked about it last time. Um, any questions about this? Oops, any question about that? Going around this zero times should be the same as going around it one time should be the same as going around it twice. Going around it once and twice here are gonna be the same. If we were appending I was here, it wouldn't be. But going around it zero times, you know, uh, would be different than going around it once if it was um, two upper and this were a string, you know, lowercase foo or something. Any question about that? Okay. Oh, over, over, over time. With that, same, same darn, um, same basic pattern um, of of sort of extracting it and retaining it, uh, etc. And then I have a diagonal functor, and the diagonal functor, you just you can apply it to each of its elements uh, for it to be the identity and uh, to, to sort of nicely work with identity. It could be. Uh, identity on each of these, et cetera. So, so that would work. Um, right. Um, okay. I, I don't know if, if that helped clear up some confusions about functors in Haskell. So I need to get your um, guidance here. Do you want to do one more section on functors or do you want to go on to categorical databases next time? What's your thought? I'm not sure what residual confusions you have on the func functor front. I'm happy to move on. I don't know about the others. Um, I'm good to go on to. Others? Is there anyone who would like me to do one more thing on functors? We could actually uh, fairly readily uh, like talk about functor composition and or go at you know more examples, but are people comfortable going on to categorical databases, which are basically applications of functors or include applications of functors? Okay, great, great. So I think we'll do that. So see if you could watch these two lectures. Uh, this is a supporting lecture um, that um, is might also be of interest, although I think these two, you'll find a more systematic exploration. I would note the seven sketches in, in compositionality book actually explicates this fairly well. Um, this uh, this notion of categorical databases, and um, you'll find that um, a reference if you want to kind of dig a little bit more. There is a company built up around this. Um, is it categorical informatics? Maybe its name. So. Um, uh, you might want to, um, you know, if you're interested in actually trying products of this sorts, um, you could look up, they, they have, a, uh, I think, a, 
categorically inspired query language and and uh, software built up which can aid data migrations uh, on the basis of uh, some of the invariants captured through reasoning categorically. Um, and essentially, I think it boils down to another topic we'll be visiting, which is natural transformations. Okay, so that's all for today. Let's let's plan on talking about that on Friday. And um, I did post an exercise uh, for you to undertake, which uh, is based around the reader functor. Uh, it's based around uh, this one. And it poses a, uh, an awkward question that I want you to sort of work with, and we could talk about the solution um, uh, at the beginning of, of the next class, because it it's something that's not obvious with functors, but it points to uh, a greater variety of functors than we have talked about uh, thus far, but ones that will be very important when we're talking about things like uh, pro functors. Um, uh, and and for some quite practical applications um, of these as well. Uh, lenses uh, will also be important. Okay, uh, so that's all for today. Um, thank you very much. And I will look forward to seeing you on Friday. Take care there. Thank you. Thanks.